Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Kenya, Finland. Back to my stories. So today I want to tell you my experiences about joining Form 1. I went to school in Kenya, high school in Kenya back in the 90s. So you know how it goes. You sit for your KCPE. That, those days it was KCPE. And you get your success card. Shout out to everybody who got a success card back in the 90s. You know how they were. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Kenyan and uh, you lived during those era during those days of uh, success cards you know how important it was for us you know it's not a culture in Finland people don't per se get success cards um success i mean people only get cards uh, after they have uh, graduated from a level let's say from primary from secondary from uni and stuff like that they don't send success cards not in their culture so uh, most Europeans might not understand what is a success card so a success card is sent to uh, people who are waiting to sit for the exam or st students waiting to sit for the exams just before a month or a few weeks before the exam wishing them success and motivating them and encouraging them so yeah that's what's up that's what used to happen in the 90s comment below if that's what's still happening yeah so you, you of course you get a success card and you sit for the exam and um those days it used to be out of uh 800 so yeah you pass and um voila you get admitted so huh, admission on itself is such a marathon for parents they keep uh scouting for nice schools Lucky for me, it wasn't so much of a hassle. I think I got uh, invitations or uh, admission letters from a couple of schools, very nice schools. Uh, in Kenya, we have so uh, public schools, public secondary schools. We have um, national school, provincial, district, and the rest. So national school being the highest, uh, the best, and it's for the brightest students. Um, Needless to say, I did not get there, <laughs> but I went to the at a provincial government school, so second best. And uh, these uh, national schools and provincial schools are known to produce uh, some of the um, best students who go get to universities and uh, get admitted for nice courses, you know, like uh, engineering, mechanics, um, medicine, and the likes. So yeah, so that's my story. So I got admitted into a very nice school. And uh, after you get admitted, usually you used to do the exams towards the end of the year. Admission letters used to come in January. Uh, latest anybody would uh, um, go for admission in secondary school was around Feb. So that's what's my story as well. And you, I, I just need to mention this because um, it, you'll understand where it comes in. So you, you stay at home um, from the time you've done your exams, that is just before uh, mid-December um, mid up to mid-January or February. And um, most of the time you're doing nothing, just watching TV and eating. So by the time you're going to high school, you're quite round, you're quite fat. Like some of us, I was a little bit round. Yeah, and you've already gotten used to just TV and sleeping uh, very late and all that kind of stuff. And then here comes high school. <laughs> Nowadays, you guys go to the Ministry of Education portal to get your admission letters. Those days, you used to go, um, used to get a message. No, letters used to come to the PO box, actually. My parents used to have a PO box, and that's where um p.o box is post office and that's where my parents got my letters so nowadays i hear everything is online go okay yeah you get an sms a lot and then you get a number or something you use your index number to go and download your admission anyway back to the 90s you guys you millennials you don't know it let me let me tell you how it used to go down those days so yeah and um, sometimes you'd get admitted into a bad school and then your parents want to go transfer you, to, I mean, to get you admitted into another school. So they'd go and speak to the um, principals and headmistresses and whatever until they get you into the school they want. If your grades are allowed, sometimes it was, um, it, was, it was not always as straight as I'm explaining. If you're Kenyan, you know what I mean. So yeah, so... 
Uh, you get admitted, you start getting ready for school, you know. So yeah, uh, I'm sure most of you are wondering what's that. Uh, so these are the kind of boxes we used to carry when we used to go to high school, like the metallic boxes. <laughs> And then um, a mattress, a bucket, because in Kenya, Kenyan boarding schools, yeah, you don't have shower, so you have to bed from a bucket, and um, yeah, and toiletries, foodstuffs were not allowed, and of course your uniform, your blanket, your bed sheets, and your pair of slippers. Um, for me it was very strange i had never gone to a boarding school before i did not know what goes on there i had never visited a boarding school i did not know how the insides of it looks like i did not know the life there what happens so there was me with my parents and all the luggage and the boxes and oh my god it's overwhelming it's like that uh, phase of growth in life where you're so excited but at the same time you're so scared and it's very intimidating because you're changing environment suddenly you don't you can you're not going to live with your parents you're going to be under the care of new adults you have to make friends in new environments uh, you're introduced to new food oh, god it's a lot uh, i went to a place to school in a place that was quite dry and very very hot in um in kenya so in the mornings it used to be dewy like it would it would be like super cold same thing at, at night and then during the day it would be extremely hot like so hot and super dusty so the environment can be also very challenging for uh, many of the people um huh. Hey, I don't even know how to break this down for people who have never studied in a boarding school in Kenya to understand, especially in your teen years, it can be very, very overwhelming. Um, anyway, I'll try and um, break it down in a manner that most of you can understand. But um, yeah, so you go with all these things and you have like a checklist that the teacher goes uh, through and uh, they, they see if you brought everything. And then you are taken where you'll be sleeping, which is a dormitory, uh, a big hall with massive number of beds, double-decker, obviously. No privacy, nothing. Like, you just stand in the middle of the hall and dress and dress. Ugh. Yeah. Um... It was one of the hardest thing for me like to sleep in a dormitory because huh, from my family I was only sharing my room with my sister one sister so uh, to have to share um, my sleeping space with uh, 50 students 60 students in the same hall uh, we had only two or three toilets uh, which for the most part one of them was always blocked uh, showers would shower just in some open space we just carry your bucket into that open space oh god it was a lot there was no privacy in the shower it, it, guys kenyan boarding schools government schools is a lot is is a different type of training i always tell people if you've gone through a secondary school in kenya a boarding school and a government school for that matter you you've been trained for this life you, you you're okay you're good you're good you can be posted anywhere china japan uh i don't know name it botswana you can be posted to sweden you'll survive you will survive the type the level of perseverance you learn in those boarding schools is on another level You'll understand as I continue in this video and um, mention some of the things, you know. Uh, so how um, they used to uh, make sure that uh, people get sleep in such massive numbers. There were prefects in the dormitories who uh, ensured that you made your bed. Um, lights were off on time. Actually, 
uh, we used to use a generator so the lights would go off at a specific time every day and they would go on at a specific time every morning so there was no question when the lights are off you have to be quiet anybody making noise the dormitory prefect to take na uh, names and report to the um, uh, teacher there was always a uh, teacher on duty for night shifts who just uh, roam around and ensure that students sleep and there's law and order and stuff like that so in the morning <sighs> let's go to the diet porridge i drank so much corn flour porridge in my four years of high school that anytime someone offers me corn flour porridge nowadays i get so agitated like it was so monotonous it was the same breakfast every day my people every day porridge 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 and porridge from corn flour nothing special oh, god ah, i can't explain it was so exhausting it was so exhausting four years of my life porridge every day cornflour porridge occasionally and very occasionally we would get black coffee with a little piece of bread and that was so occasional and it was so special like can you can you imagine guys a small piece of bread without anything on it um, no spread, nothing served with black coffee would bring me so much joy. <laughs> I'm not talking espresso. Mm -mm. Yeah, this is a simple arrangement on that um, slide showing just how we used to sit down and feed. And I'm not exaggerating. This is exactly how we sat in the dining room, in large tables, and fed. Yeah. If you went to those schools where you used to get a like um, a menu list where you just order what you want to eat and stuff like that, <sighs> kudos to you. You don't know what some of us had to go through. I'm not complaining. It prepared me for this journey, prepared me for this life. Um, and I'm very th thankful. Let me just mention that here now. I'm very grateful. I'm very thankful that I went through that type of system because it prepared me for life. It prepared me for life because after I left home, I was ready to face the world. All right, guys. So that is the positive side of it. So if you're going through the system, I don't know if schools have changed. I know for the most part, things are even worse. So take it with a pinch of salt. It's going, it's just preparing you for the life out here because it's not a joke. And once you've gone through the system, you'll be tough indeed. Um, imagine people say, oh, if you don't eat healthy, you're going to be malnutrition and you're going to suffer this and that. That's what I ate every day. And for lunch? Yeah, you got it. A mixture of boiled maize and beans. And there was nothing to added to it. There was no oil. There were no onions. There were no tomatoes. There were no spices. Nothing. And I ate that for four years. Four years of my life. Every dinner was the same. Lunch was the same. Mixture of maize, boiled maize, and beans. Every day. And you eat it and you say thank you. The only thing they used to give us was salt. Yeah, that's how it looks like. Bon appetit. Yeah. So what we used to do, um, we used to make... Um, something called mkarango if you're kenyan you know if you are you did not go to public schools let me break it down to you so uh, before opening uh, day uh we used to buy this um fat shortening uh fat shortening is like this cooking fat that is solid and then we'd buy lots of spices and buy lots of onion um we used to fry the onions so so much that uh, they become dry and then after that Fry uh, spices, add them together, uh, add to, uh, on top of it the um, short fattening. Mix everything up together and let it cool down and become solid again. And you like you have to put lots of onion and lots, lots, lots of spices because then you need to scoop a small amount so you can put into your gideri what you're looking at is called gideri a mixture of maize and beans and that was dinner at least it would smell nice it would taste better and i to give you 
appetite to motivate you to eat otherwise you starve and die man there was no other option that's all you had to eat uh some of you will ask did you have a canteen in kenya finland we used to have a canteen that only sold bread yes you had me right bread and soda and sometimes sanitary uh, towels nothing else now you are reading right yeah they do indeed add paraffin to our um, our so called theory <laughs> you know as if you thought things were not going to get worse they get worse so i don't know if this has happened in your country or it does happen in your country or in your schools that they add paraffin um crude oil crude paraffin into your food crude kerosene I, I don't I don't understand like they say oh it's going to carb libido because libido is making I mean I, and also the testosterone that is bringing high libido is making people aggressive and da 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 da, da. guys there are even studies that have been done about it I don't believe like in you know in the beginning it's, uh, why this food smells funny and uh, what's going on uh, kerosene what's going on and then someone explained to me after a while that yeah they do that so um to curb the libido among teens you know and it is also used to reduce the testosterone which also means especially in boys schools which makes them less aggressive and uh, i don't know but studies have proven others this is a study that i pulled from uh, university of nairobi that says actually they become more aggressive and the testosterone increases mm. Let me introduce you to another chapter of boarding school. My goodness, and I don't even know if I can have enough time to talk about athletics and how it was shoved down our throats, our system. It was crazy. So for remember, I, t I told you guys in the beginning of the uh, video that we used to we, we, we would, would go to form one when we are fat. <laughs> I was I went to a school where we were forced to wake up at 4 a.m. and take 10 laps around the football pitch every morning before going for morning studies so as to get fit. The headmistress had this belief that we, fat students cannot perform. Yeah. Obese students. Hey, mulikula chapati mingi nyumbani na chipo. Time to lose it aki we used to run we used to run and i was so fat i used to come among the last students almost every day and those uh, people who used to finish last used to get uh, punishment like we used to be beaten up like imagine you've run all that um all those laps 10 laps and then after that because you're among the last ones you get Punishment and by punishment, I mean this type of capital punishment you lie down on the grass and you get beaten you get beaten on your behind with a cane <sighs> I think that's one of the most painful memories for me because That was not right guys. That was not right. I mean, I get the point that we we had to be fit uh, to, to like you know move around faster be more alert in class stop sleeping in class and stuff like that but f being forced to do 10 laps around the football pitch and then w if you uh, rank among the f last ones you're beaten up that was just not right and when the bell rang uh, we had to after the morning bell rang for students to wake up the teacher expected us to show up in the field in the football pitch in our um, PE uniform, like in a sports gear, in less than five minutes. So what most students used to do, we used to sleep in the um, in the sports gear, so that we are able to just when the bell rings, you are just able to jump where your shoes end, run to the football pitch. Life was a mess. It was a nightmare. I hated form one. I hated the orientation program it was just brutal it was disgusting it uh, whoever came up with that idea needs to be sued I, I'm, I'm not even kidding it was so bad it was so bad we used to cry so much uh, I, I i cried all my tears in form one i mean guys i'm not even kidding i used to get so much punishment i used to 
hate waking up at 4 a.m. to go and run. And remember, I told you it was dewy in the morning. So you run in that long grass that is dewy, that is just brushing on your skin. And guys, it was brutal. I was fat. It was brutal for me. Ah, hated it. Yeah. So, you know, you guys, the way you go to form one and then there's nothing to do. You know, like teachers have not started teaching and... I went to a Catholic school, so that what that meant? Hands book! Yeah, we used to, we had to write. <laughs> I don't know why we were not just asked to buy these books. To keep us busy, we had to write more than a hundred hymns. Handwriting, handwriting. Ha, even I can't speak. I spent a whole month trying to write, <laughs> write um, hymns. Hundred of... Uh, even more than a hundred because the entire entire month went there I, and every day you wake up you go and borrow from twos from threes their hymns book you sit down and write and write and write and then the head teacher would come around to see huh it was terrible so yeah um so let's talk about the ab abolition block, abolition block, or whatever you want to call them, the bathrooms and the toilets. Hey, never in my life have I seen such unsanitary toilets, and I wish it not even on my worst enemy. The toilets, the bathrooms in secondary schools, boarding schools in Kenya, public boarding schools, pathetic, disgusting, filthy, dirty, always clogged, always full. And then they use a very nasty uh, washing detergent that stinks. There are so many students who, who have to wait for very few toilets. Like you have to queue and then you find a really full toilet. They don't, they don't flush them. There's no flushing system. I mean, it's even better latrine toilets. We used to, our toilets used to be like trenches, just a long trench and with partitions. And then they get full and then they they are only flushed once a week it was disgusting it, oh don't get me started it was disgusting like keeping your lady beats clean was marathon mm? ah mm -mm. no nasty mm -mm. let's go to hair <laughs> Natural hair, some of us who have 4C, majority of us had 4C. So we were allowed to have hair, long hair, but we were not allowed to do anything to it ex except brushing it upwards and tying it with a ribbon. We even had the color code for a ribbon. We used to have um, <laughs> maroon colored ribbons. I'll never forget. Hey! Our head mistress, so... Oh, like, I've, I've myself started pedagogy. I don't know what type of pedagogy they start, she started and I don't know why it was, things were allowed to run like that. And in most public schools in Kenya, I, I don't know how they associate natural foresee hair being braided or something or manipulated with performing in class, like how it hinders your performance in class. So this was the notion that if you, uh, if students have like a treated hair, like straightened hair and stuff, they'll not be able to concentrate in class. A lot of nonsense um, because on the other hand if you're in boarding school and you, your hair is text, uh, texturized so it makes it easy to just like comb or wash it makes even life easier we are not allowed to have texturized hair nothing yeah so you you're going to ask me ah I'm Kenya Finland so what happens if you have texturized hair and you go to school we used to have a headmistress who was hot-headed this woman should come first of all we used to stand in the parade in school hey i'll tell you about the parade and the pa parade <laughs> parade etiquette uh, guys you won't even believe it like huh? yeah i've been through a lot indeed <laughs> i think i was a little bit traumatized in high school hey the way they teach discipline in kenyan public schools is not even funny so one friend of mine used to like, uh, like, okay, this is the thing. If she found you with texturized hair, she used to cut it down off your head herself. 
She'd walk around in the pair of scissors when you are standing in the parade ground. You know, she finds that your she suspects your hair has been treated or something like that. She just cuts from the you know from the middle of your head from the forehead. She digs in with a pair of scissors and cuts it from the root. Hey, that woman. So opening day, uh, after we come from holidays, that was her, what she used to do. She'd just come in the parade ground with her pair of scissors shining and stand at the front and say, I'm going to inspect if any of you has broken the hair rules. And there she was, marching with her pair of scissors. And she would just cut barrels into people's heads. <laughs> Especially the Christmas holidays after the Christmas holidays. So we come back to school around January. Uh, she just walk around cutting people barrels of, of um, trenches in their forehead. Ah, high school. I'll continue with this series. Yeah.